This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural text today comes from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of St. John, beginning with the first verse down through the fifth verse, reading from the New Living Translation of the Scriptures. You'll notice there these words. After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters and Jesus' brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. And so I'm talking today simply from the subject, the issue of blood, the issue of blood. Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him, and you see it evident. They are saying, why don't you show some miracle, Jesus, and show them what you can do? You don't become famous by just hiding and playing it safe. Uh, they had plotted to kill him, and Jesus knew it's not my time yet. So sometimes when it's not your time yet, you got to lay low until it is your time. So Jesus knew what he was doing, but his brothers were trying to out him, not because they wanted him to do something to show the world. They didn't believe him, so they're like secretly saying, show us. But the ironic thing about this is that in the previous chapter, in St. John chapter 6, Jesus had just walked on the water. We don't have any record of anybody else walking on the water. I mean, Moses parted the waters and they walked through on dry land, but there's a difference between walking through on dry land and walking on the water. Jesus didn't have to part the waters. He walked on top of what other folks had to part. So Jesus is doing a miracle that nobody has ever heard of before. And since then, nobody has ever heard of it. Jesus walked on the water in John chapter 6. And then one of the most outstanding miracles for which Christianity, particularly the early Christians, use the symbol of the fish because it was emblematic to people that these were Christians because it was a reminder to them of this most spectacular miracle of Jesus multiplying fish and bread where he fed the 5,000 not counting the women and children so conservatively with the 5,000 men and then women and children that were present Jesus conservatively could have fed 20,000 people and, and it's interesting here he had just done this in chapter 6 he fed the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves in that chapter, and he had walked on the water in that chapter. Now his brothers are in chapter 7 telling him, why don't you show yourself? Prove what you can do. If you got the goods, why don't you do it? Jesus, show, show us what you can do. Now it's something when people are away from you that don't know anybody. It's something, it's a different thing if somebody is trolling you on social media saying nasty stuff about you that don't even know you. But when it's folks that's related to you, that ought to know you, and understand even the circumstances of your birth. They ought to understand prophetic things from Scripture, but his own brothers couldn't even recognize the divine divinity because they were too close. And Jesus had already told us that a prophet is without honor except in, in, you know, in, in their own hometown. They, they're, they're not even accepted there because the folks have been too close to them to really see the divinity of God operating through them. And isn't it amazing that sometimes God's anointing can be so strongly in your life and other people that, that are not even blood related to you can recognize your anointing and the folks that's related to you think that you're just another dude, you're just another girl, you're just somebody else who's saved, just a Jesus freak. They just reduce you to something because they can't see the God side of you because they know too much of the kinship side from the family reunions. They remember you when you were back then and they are judging you now based on where you were then. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? But if you'll walk rightly with Jesus, you see, even when Jesus took the fish and the bread and then multiplied that, the miracle most people don't understand did not happen when the bread and the fish left the hands of Jesus and went into the hands of the disciples. The miracle happened 
when the, the bread and the fish went from the hands of the disciples into the multitude. And, and just, just for a moment, just imagine that I'm Jesus and I'm giving you bread and meat right now to feed you. And then what is designed to feed you, you break somebody off some of that that wasn't here. So you get a, 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 a two-piece to go. And you share it with somebody else. Isn't it amazing that the same word that God has given to feed you can feed a whole multitude? But you don't get that miracle unless you share it. You see, Jesus gave it to the disciples. The church is not the multitude. The church is the disciples. Here, you're the disciples right now. You're the disciples. I'm, I'm trying to break you off some fish and some bread. I'm trying to give you a two-piece snack to go. And it is when you go with it and start sharing it, that's where the miracle happens. And most people don't feel like they've got enough because they're like, well, Bishop, well, I don't know the Bible like you. You know, I can't tell him in Genesis he's the seed of the woman, in Exodus he's a Passover lamb, in Leviticus he's our high priest, and number three. It doesn't matter that you may not know the Bible all. If you don't got two scriptures that God has made come alive on the inside of you, you may not be able to go from Genesis to Revelation, but there's a word of God that, that brought you out, that delivered you, that set you free, that has become life to you. You know this scripture. That's what you break off to somebody else. It's just two pieces. It may be two verses, it might be five verses, but if I break off what fed me, the same miracle power of the Logos now becomes converted into divine rhema out of your mouth and God will speak life and bless somebody. You don't need more bread and more fish. All that you need is for Jesus to bless the little bit that you got. I may not have much Jesus, but if you bless the little bit that I've got today, if you just bless what I already have, if you bless my seed, if you bless my seed, if you bless my seed, Jesus, I'll give you everything I've got. If God gives you his blessing, if he gives you his favor on the little, the little becomes much in the master's hand. That miracle of Jesus can happen every place you go. So you got to know how to take it and work your two-piece to go. You don't get a miracle unless you share it. You don't get a miracle unless you share it. The miracle doesn't happen unless you share it. Jesus took bread. He took you out of sin. He took you out of the world. Then he blessed you. He blessed you. He blessed you with salvation. He blessed you with the Holy Ghost. He blessed you with understanding. He blessed you with a testimony. He blessed you with a call. He blessed you with a purpose. He blessed you with a mission. He blessed you. Then, here's the third step, he broke. If you can ever stand to be broken, my God, you're not ready to be given until you have been broken. He didn't give the bread until he first broke it. Can you stand to be broken? Can he break you with disappointment? Can he break you with trying to have your own way in your own time? And can you let him break you, break you? Well, it's not my will, but thine be done. Can you break, can you deal with the Garden of Gethsemane experience where you die to yourself? Break me, Jesus. I dare you to pray the prayer. Lord, break, hey, shake your boss. Lord, break me, break me, break me. Break me out of my stubbornness. Break me out of my narcissism. Break me out of my own stubborn way. Break me out of my addiction. Jesus, if you break me, if you break me, some of you are waiting to be given, but you've not yet been broken. The prayer is break me. Brokenness on earth creates openness in heaven. And God says, I want to break you so that when I pour you out, it can come out of you. But this Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus is dealing with the hurt of his own family, his own brothers and sisters. You know he had sisters too. The Bible speaks in the plural. It actually includes the sisters, the brothers and the sisters. Jesus had half brothers and half sisters. You know they didn't have the same daddy. But they had the same mama. So he had some half-brothers and sisters. 
Some folks didn't know that, but Jesus had brothers and sisters. And his own brothers and sisters didn't believe in him. Perhaps that's why Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 36. He said, your enemies will be right in your own household. Some of you don't have to go down the street looking for your enemies. All you have to do is run through the family tree. <laughs> I, I'm just, I, I never understood this, but I would hear my daddy say this sometimes. I heard my daddy say, God gives you family, but the devil gives you relatives. <laughs> and some of the folks that you have the worst trouble with in your life are folks that are related to you, but they don't really have that blood connection in, in the realm of the spirit, you know. And, and I'm telling you, if the devil is going to use somebody to get to you, because if he can't get to you, he's coming to somebody close. And here's what I would say to you, that anyone who is close enough to help you is also close enough to hurt you. Because he can only really use close people to get underneath your skin. You know, I mean, there are times that I, I'll post something and I'll get a negative comment from some people on social media. But uh, let me just let you know that I've not lost one night of sleep <laughs> over anybody's wayward, you know, comment. Because I didn't know them and they didn't know me. But it would have bothered me if it was somebody that I knew really well and who ought to know better. And they talking to me sideways and throwing shade. I expect more out of, if you know more, I expect more. And so anybody though who is close enough to help you is also close enough to hurt you. And that's why whenever you love somebody, whenever you trust somebody, it, it's, it's, it's a, a, a relationships require faith. And faith is only required where there is a risk. You make yourself vulnerable. To love somebody is to say that, I'm, 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 I'm giving you uh, uh, my faith here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you here. And so I'm making myself vulnerable. But then I want you to realize that Jesus took the liberty of redefining the family for us by expanding its definition, not in a weird way, but in a wise way. And here's what he said, you know, uh, notice what Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 12. And this is after this incident that, that we're reading about in, in John. But Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 through 50, notice what Jesus said. As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brother stood outside asking to speak with him. And someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Anybody who does the will of my Father, that's why we can, Jesus is our elder brother. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus expanded the understanding of what real family is. He said, anybody who does the will of my Father, that's my brother, that's my mother, that's my sister. Anybody. You see, I want you to understand this, that family isn't always blood. Family isn't always blood. Family is truly bonding with people and not just staying together. There are some people that are staying together. They just stay together, but they are not really bonded. When you bond, that means that you are melded together. Normally, under some hot situations, normally it is fire that causes the union of bonding. You got to go through some heat in order to bond. You got to go through some trouble together and work through some issues in order to bond. So family is truly bonding with people and not just staying together. Family is sharing common values and practices. Families, they share common values. They share common, uh, 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 you know, practices. Family is family together. I mean, it is, it's whether you, uh, whether it's the one that you start out with, is whether it's the one you end up with, or the family that you gain along the way. Family is family. Whether it's the one you start out with, whether it's the one you end up with, or whether it's the family that you gain along the way. And family is those who love, support, respect, and care for one another no matter what. That's when you know that you've got family, but it's not necessarily blood-related. Can, can you realize that there are people, for example, my wife and I are not blood-related, but then we are family, though. We're family, but we're not blood-related. You see, we're connected in kingdom purpose. 
and that makes her family. In fact, some of the closest unions that you'll ever have with human beings on the earth may not be blood related to you because there are people that have a kindred spirit but don't share your blood and they vibe with you and understand you better than folks that were raised with you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Jesus is not against the nuclear family. He just came to expand our understanding to say, listen, that sometimes my greatest gift to you might be to come and to bring a sword into your household and separate mother and father, uh, you know, from son and daughter because they might be hindering you because they may not be saved and may not understand the gift of God that is in your life and they could derail God's purposes. And so God might say, I might have to come and bring a sword and separate some things so that I can develop my will and purpose and mission in your life. But the best of families, the best of families will experience tension at times. Tension is normal in a family life. But you got to be like a rubber band. You experience tension, but you, then you spring back. That's, that's what, you know, a rubber band is designed to take the pressure of stretching. That's tension. Whenever you stretch, tension is on your muscles. You're stretching, you're straining the relationship. But as soon as that tension comes off, you, if you keep it out of shape, too much tension on it for too long, it'll lose its original shape. And so... You can't, we're not designed to just constantly live under the tension. You gotta be able to, you gotta know, you gotta have some people in your life that you can just chill out with. I mean, you, it's good to have some serious friends that really help you to develop and they're always challenging you and questioning you, but you need somebody where their chief purpose is the serious business of laughter. Everybody needs somebody that's just a fool just to take the tension. When somebody done something crazy, They've done something crazy in your life. You, just, you need to you need always be able to reach out to that fool that knows how to make you laugh. You, you gotta, I'm, just, I'm just trying to tell you of some of my own secrets. That when life gets tense, you need somebody in your world that knows how to make you laugh. Just, it, it, it eases the tension. And don't think that it's peculiar to you. Tension has been in families way back here in the Bible. If you ever started off, the first tension came between the first man and the first woman. When Eve started usurping Adam's authority, she wanted to do what God told him to do. She, God had put lines of demarcation, said, this is, Adam, this is your responsibility. Eve, this is your, she said, mm, what you're doing, it looks better than what I'm doing. And so he said, I, I want to do that. And she usurped, and tension came in that relationship right now. And it was when the woman gave to the man that he fell. And see, God knew, Adam knew what was said to him, and Eve knew what Adam told her that God said. And he allowed her to give to him, and, and he fell. So the first tension started between the first man and the first woman. Then it was contagious. It came down to their children. The first familial conflict and, in fact, the first murder was not from strangers. They were from two brothers, Cain, who was jealous of his brother, Abel. May I just remind you of this? This is nothing but a prophetic message to us. Cain is a nickname for can't. Abel is a nickname for ability. The divine ability that God has placed in your life, there's always something rising up demonic saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, coming against your ability. You got more ability than what you realize, and Cain is trying to deny that and come against it and is jealous of your ability. The Cain is always jealous of the able. There's an able part of you that is able to stand. God has made you able to stand. God has made you able to be able to go places and to do things that uh, it can, can't do. Cain, he, he, he just can't do it, and so he's trying to talk you out of your ability, and he got jealous of it and slew him and killed him. The first murder happened between two full-blood brothers. Isn't that crazy? And then look at what happened, you know, with Abraham's ch children. His first boy, Ishmael. Second boy, Isaac. Family tension. Because of the baby mama drama. Because Madam Sarah, who is the, she's a wife. She was okay. Until the mistress, Hagar, looked at her some kind of way. You know the kind of nastiness that a woman can have with another woman by, she said with her eyes, nah, 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 nah. Because she had a baby and Sarah didn't. 
But Sarah was the, the wife legally. Hagar was the hired help. And she looked at that woman, the Bible says, with contempt. Like, nah, 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 nah. I produced this with your husband. And when Abraham got home, Sarah said, <clears throat> we need to talk. <laughs> you talking about the help? She gots to go. <laughs> she gonna have, you going to have to handle that, Abraham. Deal with it. You started it, now fix it. And can you imagine? Now, he, he, he loves the child. But it was a familial issue, Ishmael and Isaac. And we're still dealing with that today, the battle between the Islamic community and the Jews, because Ishmael became the father of these Islamic folks, and Isaac, the father of the Jews, and they are still at war. Hamas, Israel. They're still at war to this day. It started in a family conflict. It's a family feud because they are brothers. Many of you may not realize this, but I've invited to, been invited to speak in, uh, in Pakistan several times, and I've been invited several times to speak in uh, India. They're the same people. They used to be one nation altogether. They're split, they're cousins. Can you imagine the kind of familial division that comes from people who are related to each other? You're talking about an issue of blood, they're blood related. The Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans are the distant cousins of the Jews, and they can't get along. In fact, the Samaritans are despised in the eyes of the Jews, and they are their relatives. An issue of blood. King David had a, as, as wonderful as he was, a man after God's own heart, but his children couldn't get along. He had one of his boys, Absalom, that even did a plot to overthrow his dad and take the throne. Brothers fighting each other, trying to, you know, it was, it's not cute, it's, it's messy. And, and you thought your family was crazy. I hope that when you read, really read the stories of the Bible, this is not a dull book at all. This is a fascinating book with some interesting drama and murder and people washing their hands and hiding it. It didn't start with you. This. And tension is experienced in our modern day blended families. We see it with baby mama drama and baby daddy drama. We, we see it in the tension between stepdads and stepchildren and stepmothers and their stepchildren. All of this is an issue of blood. And remember after Cain had slain his brother Abel, and God says, where is Abel, your brother? The Lord said that his blood cries up from the ground to me. And then Cain didn't want to lie, so he asked the question, am I my brother's keeper? But the proverbial answer to this question is an emphatic yes. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. Yes, you are. And I want you to notice the tension that grew up in Jacob's family. In Genesis chapter 37, look at verses 1 through 5. Notice this. This is just real life, real family situation. Notice this. So Jacob settled again in the land of Canaan, where his father had lived as a foreigner. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, uh, that he often tended his father's flock. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, uh, Billa and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brothers were doing. In one family, now, he, now he's, he's got a family snitch. <laughs> Can you imagine the tension that he was creating right there with his brothers because you know, you got this child coming in. I'm going to tell you what John, John Boy was doing, and this one was doing. And he started snitching on his brothers who were not doing right. And notice verse 3. And Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. He was proud of that boy. He's like, this is the son of my old age here. It made him feel new all over again. And, but here now comes nepotism, favoritism, 
in, the own, in his own family, and the brothers could see that their father favored this baby child more than any of them. And so notice, so one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because his father loved him more than the rest of them, and they couldn't say a kind word to him. And then one night Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more than ever. Dude, they already don't like you. And now you tell them a dream. Not a dream that made them look good, a dream that makes you look good and that they're going to come in, in submission to you and bow down before you along with your mama and your daddy. And his brothers were so upset about this, they went to their daddy and they said, Daddy, this dude has flipped out. He said, not only are we going to bow down, he said, you and mama going to bow down to him. And the daddy said, you know, now I was all right with your brothers and stuff bowing down. He said, now, wait, wait a minute, boy, wait Wait, what you saying about me and, me and my wife? What you? I mean, when you dream a dream like that and folks already don't like you, just zip it. Loose lips sink ships. Just, and throw away the key. And I guess you can imagine that his telling the dream didn't go over well in a blended family. You can imagine that that didn't go over very well. And then I wanted you to see familial conflict, tension in Moses' family. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 through 9. Notice here. While they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because he had married a Cushite woman. The Cushite woman was a distinctive African woman. Cushites were, these were what would you call burnt faces. That Moses liked the chocolate. <laughs> they were involved in a swirl. I mean, it is what it is, you know. And, and then they said, to the Lord, his, his, his brother and sister, you know, Aaron and Miriam, they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Hasn't he spoken uh, through us too? But the Lord heard them. Now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. So immediately the Lord called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. See, God is wonderful in conflict resolution. And he said, go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. And so the three of them went to the tabernacle, and then the Lord descended in the pillar of a cloud and stood at the entrance of the tabernacle. Aaron and Miriam, he called, and they stepped forward. And the Lord said to them, now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in dreams. I would speak to them in dreams. But not my servant Moses, all of my house, he is the one I trust, of all my house. I speak to him face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. He sees the Lord as he is. So why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? And the Lord was very angry with them, and he departed. By that time, Miriam as well, she broke out with leprosy all over her body. And Aaron would have broken out. But the only reason that God spared him is because he was a priest, and he would have been disqualified as a priest had he had leprosy. So God was like, I'm not, I'm, the only reason that I'm not doing this to you, Aaron, is to protect my interest in, in being able to minister to my people through you. He said, so, he said, but you watch it. He said, I hope I made myself clear. He said, yo, come here, come here, boys. Come here, girl. And God told him how it was. But he had to resolve that familial conflict that happened between them uh, in, in that moment. And so, Here's what I want you to see is that when God has something for you, he'll help you to achieve it. I don't care who doesn't like you, who tries to come against you. I don't care who exits out of your life. God, if what God has for you, God will help you. Notice what he said in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 18. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so that he can show you his love and compassion. I want you to see this. God must wait for you to come to him. He's waiting for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion, not his anger, not his, his, his bitterness towards you, his love and his compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God, blessed are those who wait for his help. But he's waiting on you to come to him. God says, I'm not going to force you. I'm waiting on you to come. You come when you get ready. And listen, God has nothing on his 
on his uh, hands but time. You will never beat God at the waiting game. God will wear you out. I'm telling you, you won't have to tap out and come to him. And uh, when we come to the Lord, he says, come to me, come to me, come to me. When you, and here's what I would say to you. When, you. when you do come to the Lord, also bring your children. This was not an individual thing. This was household salvation. When the blood was put on the house back during the time of the Passover, it meant that the death angel passed over. It meant that everything that was about to happen in that household wasn't just for your salvation of one person who ever put the blood on there. It was for everybody that was under your household, everybody that was attached to your last name, everybody that was living in that place where you had made a covenant with God, where you had put the blood. And let me just tell you this, it's, it's, it's almost like in, in, in football uh, where you, you're, you're, you're asking the blood of the lamb, you're asking Jesus, Jesus, I need you to run interference for my children. When he runs interference, that means that he begins to block everything that is aimed at trying to take your children out. You need to just pray that prayer and say, Jesus, I need you to run interference for everything that's in my household. I don't know who I came to tell this about today, but I just heard the Lord say, you need to pray for the Holy Ghost to, to run interference for your children. Their destinies are at stake. Their gifts and callings are at stake. And you need divine supernatural help that will run interference, which means that he blocks the enemy who's trying to tackle them and take them down. You got to pray for divine interference. You need Jesus to run interference to say, I'm putting the blood over everything in my house. They might not have come to know you yet. They may not have prayed yet. They may not have read their Bible yet. But everything that has come from my loins, everything that is in my house, I put the blood on it. 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 Come on, blood. Run interference. Run interference. Because when a demon sees the blood, they stop in their tracks and turn the other way. They cannot cross a bloodline. You need him today to be able to run interference with the blood. Every time that you pray for your children, you begin to plead the blood, plead the blood, plead the blood. This has nothing to do with logic. Plead the blood. Plead the blood. They're acting out. Plead the blood. You've talked to them. Plead the blood. You brought them to church. Plead the blood. You've got them a Bible, but plead the blood. You need supernatural help to plead the blood of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 13 said that all of your children shall be taught by the Lord and great will be their peace. That, that, that word peace there is not just peace to where you can just have some quiet to be able to sit out and read and just look at the stars. No, 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 this is a peace that means that you'll have safety, that you'll have healing, that you'll have deliverance, that you'll have prosperity, that you'll have protection, the shalom of God. Shalom was not just peace. Shalom was about overall well-being. It was about the prosperity of your mind, the prosperity of your soul, the prosperity of your life, physically, mentally, relationally. It meant that God would bring this, and he says, your children will be taught of me, and, and, and great is going to be their peace. But also in the same chapter of Isaiah, chapter 54, where it's talking about great will be the peace of, of your children, and they'll be taught of the Lord. It also says this same verse in Isaiah, chapter 54. that no weapon formed against you will prosper. The weapons will be formed. Uh, they, 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 they might shoot, and something will come after you that, that feels demonic and looks demonic, but at the end result, it won't work. It's not going to work. They might slow you down. They might injure you. But it's not going to be successful in, in their assignment to take you out because God's got a covering over you. He's got a covering over you. He says in every word, he says, you, you, you know, every tongue that speaks against you, you shall condemn it. You'll condemn it. But God has a, God has a plan. God loves the family, and God has a, a plan for the family, particularly 
for those where the man has been taken out of the family. So he calls them the fatherless and the widows. They're the two. And, and, and in fact, the New Testament, it says pure and undefiled religion before God is this, that you take care of orphans and widows. They are the families that have had the man snatched out because the man was their provider and he was their protector. And so now God begins to step in with his familial plan rollout. It's located in Psalm 68, verse 5 and 6. Notice, he's a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. That is God whose dwelling is holy. And then notice what he says, verse 6. God places the lonely in families. That's the single person who's out here lonely all by themselves. He places the lonely in families. Families. If you don't have a family, God will gift you somebody that will be like a family to you. God places the lonely in families. God places the lonely in families. Why is this critical? Because God gave a promise to Abraham that through you, Abraham, shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. You got to be in a family in order to get it. So God takes the single person, the, the one that has been isolated, the one that is lonely. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free. There are certain things that you can't get free until you get connected to a family and gives them joy because they'll hold you accountable. They'll pray for you. They'll encourage you. But he makes the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. There are some folks that just won't do right. They won't obey the rules of the house, and you're going to uh, dry up out in a hot, scorching land because you're not going to be able to be brought into the protection of that family. But God will bless you. He takes the solitaire and sets them in families, but God himself is the defender of the fatherless and the, the widows. And I'm just telling you, you'll have to realize this, that where there is a void, God will fill it. Where there is a hurt, God will heal it. Where there is a destiny, God will reveal it. And so we need God. God is drawn to hurting and broken people. He really is. He's drawn to hurting and broken people. And there are so many people that get out of fellowship with their families. And it breaks the heart of God. Because here they are now resentful, and re when you become resentful, it, it, it opens a portal to the demonic. Demon spirits begin to fester and to talk to people who are offended. It's the, it's the, it's the, the Greek word scandalon, offense, offense. And notice what it sounds like, scandalon, a scandal is on. And he uses scandal to create offense. He's trying to come and offend people. And then they wind up with deep resentment. And here's what resentment is. It's re-sentiment. Re means again. Sentiment comes from the word sentire, which means to feel. Every person who is resentful, they feel the pain of what hurt them all over again. So when you're resenting others, if they don't even know it, generally. And it's not hurting them, it's carrying the person who is resentful, full of feeling the pain of what happened all over again. Like if somebody borrowed money for you and never paid it back, every time you think of them, you could be in a good mood. And you think about somebody that owes you money, and you start feeling the pain of all of that all over again. It was, it was okay. You had already let it go. You had already maybe reconciled in your own mind that, man, you know what? I'm not going to probably ever get that money back again. And then some people have the unmitigated goal before they paid that debt to come back and ask you, man, let me just hold a 20. Dude, you didn't pay the last 20 back. It wasn't about the 20. It's about the principle of the thing. And so how you handle the 20 is how you handle everything. And so if they didn't handle that well, but, and after a while, if people keep telling you they're going to do something, and it, whether it's a father telling a son that I'm coming to your game and he never shows up, you start creating pain, the pain of the disappointment of a dad not showing up, the pain of a mother who sees her daughter as a competition. And now there's a strained relationship between mother and daughter. And now the daughter is resenting her own mother. And every time she thinks of her mother, instead of it being a place of comfort, and joy, now it's feeling the pain all over again. That my own mother now is my competition in her own mind. 
she is feeling this way against me or the son is feeling this way and you're living in familiar relationships of people who are carrying resentment which is that they are feeling again the pain and that's why if you want to get healed of it you have to go through the process of forgiveness you have to forgive because resentment only punishes the vessel that carries it the people to, toward whom it's aimed, they don't even know most of the time that you're resentful of them. And they're going on about their business, living their happy life. And you're hurting, feeling the pain all over again because you don't know how to forgive. Forgive it and let it go. Not, not so that they can get away, but so that you can heal. Because you keep feeling the pain. You keep pulling the scab off and stabbing yourself all over again where the wound is, and you feel it over and over. That's resentment, resentiment, resentire, where I am feeling again what hurt me in the beginning. So that's why you have to let go resentment because resentment is the doorway that leads into bitterness, and whatever becomes bitterness in your soul is a root that will then continually bear fruit. But it opens a portal to the demonic to cause bitterness to be able to fester out of your soul and you'll be feeding people this bitter, bitter fruit. And there you are now standing once again like a victim in a problem that you created and in your own narcissism. Now trying to blame somebody else over something where you kept feeling the pain over and over and the Lord is saying, let it go. And if you let go of it, I can heal you of that and your joy can come back and I can restore you and you can once again be made whole because Jesus is a restorer. He came to restore and to repair the breach. It's amazing. And then you'll discover that this is true that for whatever reason, I don't know why this is, but whenever too much pain from resentment, feeling it again, just comes back over into your life, whenever there's too much pain that accumulates within you, we often try to alleviate that pain with pleasure. And here's the problem. When we are trying to alleviate the pain with some type of sinful pleasure, it generally turns into the addiction, and then the addiction leads to more pain. And it's a vicious cycle. You're trying to get rid of the pain, and so you go and find a pleasure, whether it is sex, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, whether it's pornography, and, and, and trying to get out of the pain, you're using pleasure. And then you wind up with an addiction, which creates more pain. And I love something that Simone Will said, French philosopher, that all sins are attempts to fill voids. All sins are attempts to fill voids. Something is unmet. And it is interesting that when we repent ourselves, because we've got to do two things, repent and then forgive, because we need the forgiveness of God, and then we've got to forgive others that have hurt us. And if you don't forgive them, then you're going to carry resentment, which means that you will feel the pain of it over and over again. So you have to let it go. And that's why the Bible talks about repentance Metanoia is the word in the Greek. It literally means a change of mind. Metanoia. But the opposite of metanoia in the Greek, metanoia, the opposite of metanoia is paranoia. So either you get your mind renewed with the Word of God, or you'll always be paranoid that everybody is looking at you, and everybody is working against you, and everybody has got this issue with you. So you either experience metanoia, voluntarily by releasing and falling on the, on the rock and allowing God to help you, or you'll walk around in paranoia. Why is the whole world is against me and this is happening? You'll deal with paranoia. It's interesting, but God loves the family. And he's, his heart is deeply compassionate about family. And it bothers me that we sensationalize criminal things, particularly where there has been bloodshed. And they have a little saying in the, in the news industry that if it bleeds, it leads. So they want to lead with those stories that's always talking about bloodshed. Whether it's a 14-year-old in North Atlanta that goes in and 
creates an incredibly heinous crime. Something is wrong at home. Something is wrong with him. There's a lot of resentment. Most of these guys that do that kind of thing, and that's why it's not healthy. They need to be set in families where they can get healed. It's amazing. And then notice the woman, this familiar story, story in Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 24 through 34. Jesus went, went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. They were just pressing and touching Jesus. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood, this was an issue with her relatives. You, 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 I know that it was an issue of what she was bleeding out, but it's a picture of having an issue with folks that were blood-related to her. For 12 years, 12 is very, it's not just coincidental, 12 is the number of foundations. It means that the, that the abuse happened in the foundational years of her life. She's still bleeding out as a grown woman now over something that happened in the foundation of years. Whether it's a wicked stepfather. And sometimes natural fathers abuse their own daughters uh, or, or abandon their mother and now they're dealing with the daddy wound because all she knows is that daddy now didn't merely show up. He didn't leave mama. He left her. And something on the inside of her makes her feel as though he didn't want me. If he wanted me, he wouldn't have left me. And a little child who's not even able to comprehend, why in the world is my daddy not here? Why didn't he show up at my recital? Why didn't he come to my school and participate in my program? Why, why wasn't he there? And they don't even realize the drama that's happening between the mom and the dad. And oftentimes the man doesn't want to deal with the drama. He still loves his child, but he can't handle the trauma that's, that all of this drama and trauma that surrounds his interaction with the child. And so he says, I'll step away. And in the midst of all of that, here's this woman now. She's got an issue of her blood. And notice verse 26. It says, and she'd suffered many things of many physicians. Not only did she have it from a house, she's now suffering from physicians, and it's because she spent all she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. Can you imagine that you spend all of your money trying to solve a problem and it only gets worse? And when she heard of Jesus, my God, faith comes by hearing. Then she did something. She didn't just sit there. She came. Jesus said, I'm waiting on you to Come. Come. She came in the press behind, and then she did something. She touched. She didn't just show up. She then made a move. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, she said, she spoke her faith. If I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. She said exactly what she wanted to happen. And notice, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. The feeling was the last thing that happened. The first thing is that she heard, and then she spoke and said, you know, if I can just touch his clothes. And she came, and then she acted on her faith. She reached out, and, and you better know that every time that a woman is stepping out in faith to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, in a time that you're touching for the supernatural to happen, for the divine to happen, there's this little voice of doubt that's saying, get your hand back. Why are you going to touch him in the midst of a crowd and other people are touching them and nothing is happening to them? And so he said, faith said, touch him. Doubt said, get your hand back. Even while you're trying to exercise faith, doubt is right there saying nothing is going to change this time. It's going to be just like it was last time. But she can't. She heard of Jesus. She came in the press behind and she touched him and she said with her mouth, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. She spoke her faith. And then the last thing that happened is if she felt that the fountain of her plague was dried up. And then notice in Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. Her faith was so strong, it pulled the virtue out of him. She turned in the, he, Jesus turned in the press behind and he said, who touched my clothes? Because he knew something had happened. And he wasn't doing this just because he was curious as to which one did it. He didn't want her faith to be misplaced in a fabric. So he wanted to locate her faith. And so Jesus his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and they say, Who touched me? And then he looked about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, she came and she fell down before him and told him all the truth. And then notice, and then he said unto her, Daughter. That was the beginning of her healing right there. She'd never felt like anybody's daughter. Something was broken on the inside of her that nobody and now the king of kings. And the Lord of Lords, the man that had walked on the water, 
the man that took fish and bread and broke it and multiplied it, looked at her and says, daughter, that I know that you don't have a man in your life, but now I'm daddy. Daddy's here now. When he said daughter, he said everything, she didn't need to hear another word. She said, this man has claimed me. He's healing my father wound. He, he, Jesus has said to me, daughter, that man called me daughter. If he didn't say another word, he had said enough when he said daughter. He gave identity to somebody that was wondering, does anybody down here care about me and how I'm struggling all by my lonesome self? I don't know who I'm talking to in this place today, but Jesus will identify and heal you just by saying, I am your father. I'm your daddy. Daughter, 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 thy faith has made you whole. He said, I don't want you to think that this is some, some mystical thing that happened with a piece of fabric. This was not about fabric. This was about the faith that you came. You had a need and there was a desperation in your soul and you spoke your faith out and said that if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. That I'm not going to leave this place the same way that I came today in Jesus' name. And he told her, you go in peace this time and then be whole again. Be made whole again. Be made whole because I'm your daddy now. Now I'm bringing you into right relationship. The offense came by one that did the wrong thing and didn't know how to handle relationship and the restoration comes by another one that begins to reestablish. We had a guy that worked for us and he was, he was angry against whites and what they had done to the, to the history, throughout history to people of color. And he was just all into the black power movement. And then he was in a pool hall one night playing pool and some things got out of hand and he wound up being shot. And they shot him in his leg and it struck the femoral vessel. And he started bleeding out massively, rapidly. And here the black power man was not shot by a white guy, he was shot by a black man. And there he was, he struggled and dragged himself out of the place, collapsed on the sidewalk because he was losing such rapid amounts of blood. And God has a way that the very hatred that he had toward whites, God sent a white man there to rescue him and save his life. His whole attitude changed after that. The offense came by one that was unrighteous, and the redemption came by one that was righteous. So when the first Adam messed up, Jesus Christ, the last Adam, we wouldn't have been in this sin, we wouldn't have had death on us had the first Adam not messed up. But the last Adam came to restore what was lost by the first Adam. And now we get the right for God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him shall have everlasting life. And so what we lost was that eternal life, but now Jesus restored the eternal life through the last Adam. And so when an offense comes by a bad woman or by a bad man, God uses a good woman or a good man to be the restoration of that. So when one man has been an abuser, God will send a righteous man that will come in that will know how to love you as God loves you and be able to bring restoration into your home. Don't, don't throw your hands up and say, I'm not going to deal with that. And there are some people that think that I'm not going to deal with men anymore because they're abused. And let me tell you, there are some abusive women. And the, the issue is, is that you're going to an abuser. Abusers, abusers come in both sexes. They come in all of the genders. You will find people that can smell blood when it's in the water. And however you identify as a shark, when blood is in the water, something savage comes over you. And it's not personal, it's just the way your nature is wired. And then people don't, they wonder why do I keep attracting Sharks is because you haven't been healed and you keep bleeding in everybody's water that you get into and they are just doing what the instinct of their nature designs them to do. They can sniff and tell that there's something that's in the water and that says it's mealtime and then you get devoured. But Jesus is the one that is looking at you now and saying, 
the righteous one has come. Daughter, son, wherever the abandonment has been, Jesus said, I'm the one sent on the mission this now to restore. God searched for a man to come and stand in the gap and found none. Now Jesus volunteers from heaven and he comes and he stands in the gap to be able to bring to us a restoration in our families. And it is time now, it's time for us to stand as intercessors for our families and run interference because something demonic is trying to take hold of our children. And they're the most precious things that we have. I want to ask that nobody walk now just in reverence to God. As we reverence God, God will do some incredible things. That's something when you reverence the holy God of Israel. Your walking will be a distraction to someone's soul. You don't want to distract people who are about to make a decision for Jesus. And I encourage you now to just wait in God's presence. God is holy. He's sovereign. You can lay aside your own personal agenda and just say, God, I'll just honor you in this moment. Because the Lord said, if you will come to me, that he would heal, that he would restore, if we'd just come. And there was a dear lady by the name of Charlotte Elliott. She penned these words that were sung in most of the Billy Graham crusades. Just as I am without one but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come, O Lamb of God, I come. If you're here today and you just need to come to him and God says that I've got you and I'll show you love and compassion, not judgment and not sending you to hell while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want you to just stand up and walk in. Just come, come, come to the altar and say, Lord, I need you. I'm desperate. There's some things that need to happen in me, Jesus. I need you. If that's you, I want to encourage you to just get up out of your seat right now and just come, just come. Just come, just as you are. You don't clean yourself up for him. He knows you and loves you just the way that you are. He loves you just the way that you are. I come. Can you say the song again? Just as. I am without one plea. Their only plea was that the blood, it was shed for me. And that thou biddest me come, thou be. you might want to stand as an intercessor for your family that is dysfunctional. I am without one feet but that thy blood was shed for me.
a restorer. Until you get that thing healed, you'll be in and out of relationships, and you'll find problems everywhere that you go. But this is our way of saying, God, I'm tired of all of the drama, the in and out, the getting excited for a season, and then this falling right through my hand. Jesus, I need to be healed. I want to let go of my resentment of everybody that hurt me, everybody that walked out of my life, everybody that used me, let it go. Let it go. There's something greater ahead of you when you let that stuff go. Now you're just coming, not in your pretense. This is in your honesty to just say, Lord, I, I come just the way that I am. I'm broken. I'm hurt. I'm weary. I'm worn. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm hurting Jesus. I come just as I am, just as I am, just as I am, just as I am, just as I am. There's some sons that are here that never heard the words from your father saying that they were proud of you. You never heard your father say that, that you were loved. You need to come and experience the love of a father that will never abandon you, that will never lie to you, that will never go back on his word. And there are some daughters that are here that you've not had a proper relationship with a natural daddy and sometimes even a natural mother. You don't even know what love feels like. Today, come on, because this is the family of God. Jesus said that those that do the will of my father, they're my mother and my father, my brothers, my sisters. That's my family. He was expanding us to understand a spiritual family that begins to bring restoration into us. And until you get that right, you won't even know how to deal with your natural family appropriately. And I pray in the name of Jesus today that God will begin, begin to connect you with relationships that'll show you how to do family right, that'll show you how to love each other, forgive each other, walk with each other through mistakes and failures and mishaps, and that God can show you how to become a man of God, a woman of God, healed, walking as a son and as a daughter of the living God who carries virtue on the inside of him that will go in them inside of you and it will stop your bleeding issues, the issues that you had with your blood. I believe that there are a few more hurting, wounded folks that have been traumatized in the foundational years of your life. There are some folks that have never told anybody about the abuse that you went through, but you still are dealing with the effects of that right now. I want to give you time to come, just for you to get up out of your seat and come. To be of God. I'm going to sing it through one more time as we wait on it. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood, but that thy blood, it was shed for me, was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come, thou be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. May he heal that, that thirst that's been in you. May he heal that hunger in you. You're, you're looking for another human being to give you what only God himself can give you. And if you're looking for people to do what only God can do, you'll be disappointed every time. But if you'll trust Jesus, I'm telling you, there, there are some godly men that God can bring into your life. There are some godly women that God can bring into your life and model for you the way that have the love of God. They've got a heart filled with God's love that can restore you, that can restore you, that can restore you, that can restore you, that can restore you. If you know that you're one of those folks, you got a superabundance of God's love in your heart. 
I, I want you to just come and just put your arms around some of these folks that are standing up here, mothers and fathers. You know you got some, just some of them. Ask God to just lead you to the one. He, he, he's, he's God, I trust him. Sometimes you just need to know that you're not alone. God will bring somebody within arm's reach. And I'm telling you, you can get healed today. This is not an intellectual exercise. It is the power of God in demonstration in a loving family of communion. And some, sometimes you just got to just let them know you're not in this alone and you're going to make it through this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. God's a restorer. God is a restorer. God is a restorer. He's a healer. The fountain of your blood is getting ready to, to dry up. Mm. Mm. And I don't know who this word is for, but there's a woman that is here. You've been trying to have children and you've been on the verge of being threatened with a hysterectomy. And the supernatural power of God is going down into your female reproductive organs and God has given you a miracle in this hour. I am sure of it. I am sure of it. There's a warm flow and a power of the presence of God that's going down into your body right now. Even now, even now, even now, even now, even now. It's going to begin to make your affections come back into normalcy in the name of Jesus. My, he's a healer, he's a healer, he's a healer. I need intercessors to be interceding right now because I need you to run interference on their behalf. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel the glory of God resting on his people today. I feel the glory of God. God is in the house. He's in the building now. Just let him do the work, let him do the work, let him do the work. He's the author and the finisher. Whatever he started, God will finish. Whatever he started, God will finish. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. 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 He's healing mother wounds and daddy wounds. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He'll make you a man after his own heart. He'll make you a woman after his own heart. You're not a number. You're not just another person. You're a son. You're a daughter. Father, in the name of Jesus, the name of Yeshua, we thank you, Lord, that the same healing virtue that flowed out of him, that went to the woman with the issue of blood, Lord, is still flowing to people generations afterwards down through the vista of time that you're moving even by your spirit lord uprooting lord undoing outdoing overdoing everything that the devil has done lord it's time now for the pain to stop that has caused resentment where they keep feeling it over and over and over again and the hurt has created callousness in the heart and there's a hardness and there's been a shell there and they didn't want to let love come in and they didn't want let love go out but god when nothing could go out, nothing could also come in. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will remove from them the stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh that will be able to respond to love God. I pray that you will begin to heal them, Lord Jesus, and that you will send others, God, that will have a righteous heart 
and love and honor and character and dignity in them, Lord, that you will bring into their life to be able to stand with them, to encourage them, dear Lord Jesus, to begin to show them a way, God, of what real manhood looks like and real womanhood looks like. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you'll show them, God, examples clearly of what it means to be a son of the living God and a daughter of the Most High. I pray, God, that you will bring your virtue of your character down into the hearts of your people as we reach out, God, to you, and that as we release the hurt, as we release the hurt, as we express, God, that we forgive, that we let go the pain where we've been injuring ourselves over and over and over and over again, we decree in the name of Jesus that it stops today. The pain stops today. We end that resentment today. We let go the bitterness today. We uproot it. Everything that you've not planted in the name of Jesus, come out. Come out. Come out. Shake Muko Rataposo. In the name of Jesus. Lord, and let healing begin to flow. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over their households over their bodies, over their minds, over their emotions, even over their memories, God, in the name of Jesus. There to the heart, may the blood be applied. There to the heart, may the blood be applied. There to the heart, may the blood be applied. Lord, we plead the blood in the name of Jesus that you will run interference against anything that would try to derail them and snatch them back down into a pit of depression and self-aggrandizement of their own flesh, Lord. Father, we know that our souls can find no rest until they find their rest in you. And I pray in the name of Jesus today, God, that you will allow every soul that is before you right now find their rest in you so that they will not seek from the world things that only you can give in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe it, just lift your hands and say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. And I, I call you a man of faith. I call you a woman of faith. And it's your faith that makes you whole. It is your faith that makes you whole in Jesus' name. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. God is awesome. God is absolutely awesome. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.